My name is Drew Gephardt, I'm the International Services Manager. With me today we have Andrea Lee, who is the leader of our uh, Dance Study Abroad program to Ghana, which has been running for the past nine years now. And then we also have Simon Chan, who has been leading the uh, Business Principles of Retailing course for the past, uh, this will be his third year going. And then we have two students who uh, participated in programs. Uh, we have Simone who went to Japan last year and then we have Christina who went to Egypt and we have Maya. Yeah. Hey Maya, you want to come on down? We have Maya as well. Maya actually went to Belize and to Egypt last year. She did two, two programs uh, in one summer. So uh, pretty fantastic. Just a quick overview is uh, and some ways to learn some more about our programs. We do have a podcast now uh, through KGPC so if you want to go on the uh, KGPC website, it's uh, International Conversations, and we have four episodes that are now uploaded. We've had students on the show, uh, faculty, so you can hear uh, more about their experiences on, on, our, uh, on our podcast. If you're a faculty member looking to create programs, we have a study abroad proposal form. We also have um, a resource called Study Abroad Opportunities for Community College Students and Strategies for Global Learning. That's a mouthful right there. But it has a lot of great resources on creating programs, uh, especially um, you know, in regards to low cost initiatives for expanding study abroad opportunities. So how do we create programs uh, that are affordable for students? And then we also have a, a study abroad Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash Peralta Study Abroad. We have our YouTube channel. And if you go to Peralta, Peralta's YouTube page, we have a playlist of videos there uh, which feature our students and faculty who have done programs uh, going back to uh, 2018. And there are uh, several different ones. We may uh, show one or two of them today as well. So since 2015, uh, the data goes back earlier than that, but uh, I'll start with 2015 is we had four programs with 46 students. The following year, we had 53 students go on four programs. 2017, we had 55 students go on four programs. And in 2018, we had 64 students go on five programs. Then, last year, we got this crazy idea to expand our programs. And we went with eight programs, uh, eight different countries, and over 100 students that went abroad this past summer, 110 students. Um, this will put us definitely in the top 15 for community colleges in the U.S., uh, maybe higher, depending on what those figures are uh, when they come out next year. Uh, but it was a, a very busy summer putting these programs together, um, but everybody made it home safely, which was my biggest, <laughs> biggest uh, concern and focus. But, um, and today you'll get to hear from a couple of the students who went on those programs. So these are the eight programs that we did this past summer, which were uh, business in China, and then we also did business in Japan. We had critical thinking in Belize. We have a cosmetology program that goes to London each year. Uh, this will be their third program. Third, this upcoming year will be their third time going to London. We did our first uh, ever Arabic in Egypt program. We had a social justice program in Jamaica, a Spanish program in Mexico, and then our, our dance and intercultural communications program in Ghana. Here's some photos from, from the uh, programs last year. The uh, picture on the right are the students who went to, bottom right are the students who went to London. They got certificates for, um, for a class they went to at Tony and Guy. And then um, you can kind of work your way around to kind of guess where the other places are. Egypt, China, Belize, Ghana, and um, Japan. And what's really interesting about the Ghana program, you can see that it's all males. Um, there's a much higher percentage of females who go abroad than males. And so what was great about the Ghana program is we actually had, I want to say there were more males than females on that, on that program. And uh, that's highly unlikely. And even in regards to ethnicities, we had over 50% of our students were African American compared to in the US, the general statistic is 70% white who go abroad. 
So we're really reversing the trend and helping more and more students uh, go abroad that typically do not get the opportunity to. The impact of study abroad this past summer after we sent out a survey, 95% um, said that their experience changed their perception of how the world works in some way. And then 95% also said that their experience changed their view of their home country here in the US. 80% said they experienced some change they became more sociable and adaptable in a new environment. And then 75% did experience some change in improving their sense of independence. So there was some really great changes that took place in the students' lives. In regards to scholarships, we have our Peralta Colleges Foundation Scholarship. The application is uh, open now, and the deadline to apply is March 1st, so there's plenty of time for students to apply for scholarships. And uh, one of the largest scholarships out there is the Gilman Scholarship. Students who are going abroad for at least two weeks can apply for this scholarship, and they award uh, anywhere from $3,000 to $5,000. So those are two, um, two big scholarships. Um, I would like to mention that to, today's presentation is really, um, uh, I'd like to thank Michael Goldberg, who helped put this on, as well as our director, Thomas Torresgill. Um, this is a part of what's, what's called International Education Week. And... It's a nationwide event, so all this week, um, schools from around the U.S. are actually doing, um, doing events, doing presentations of these types, um, basically to celebrate international education. That's why we're doing this here today. And then uh, lastly, I'll just share, we do have six programs that are officially approved, signed off, ready to go uh, for next summer. Uh, we have a few that are still pending. Um, but the ones that are going uh, next year are, are London to Cosmetology. We have a new program to Greece, which is Anthropology, our business in Japan, which Simon, if you wanted to come on up, I'm going to have Simon speak a little bit about his program. Uh, we have our English Critical Thinking to Belize, our Ghana program, which is going to include Tanzania this year as well, uh, the Dance and Leadership program. And then we're also doing, College of Alameda here is doing a program to Germany uh, in conjunction with Encinal High School. So there's going to be high school students going along with college students, and uh, that's going to be Art 3. And most of these classes are all transferable. You get credit. And the great thing about going with the class is you can apply for scholarships, you can apply for financial aid, and, uh, and people are more willing to give. People are a lot more generous when you tell them that you're going on a class to study abroad. I think um, they're willing to help you out to get there. So money should never be a barrier to stop you from attending a study abroad program. Simon, why don't you come on up? I'm gonna have Simon Chan speak about his trip to Japan. Hi everyone, you're welcome. Um, this is the first year I'm leading student to Japan. So why I bring them to Japan? Because uh, I find that Japan is uh, uh, the second larger economy in the world. So the, the USA always the best, you know. Um, if you can compare the both system, what's the difference? And you will, you will find some little bit uh, a, a culture, a Japanese culture in Bay Area, like um, Japanese restaurant, uh, and kind of snack food, toys, um, cross pay functions in uh, Japan town. So uh, my student told me that they are really interesting about what's the great difference of the culture uh, be uh, between American Japan. So, um, and then another reason is I, I always go Japan. Like uh, this weekend, I go Japan, Japan for cycling. Yeah, um, I almost spend three or two times each year. <laughs> I, I will have a uh, cycle activities. Uh, I am planning ahead, you know. But this class is, is fun. Why? Because uh, we, I bring students walking the whole day for all eight days around the, the downtown Japan, Tokyo, Yokohama, uh, Kawasaki, and even the mountain Fuji. So uh, you really explore the, the most uh, attractive uh, uh, science, science spot in Japan. And you know the culture and food and while you're studying. So I bring all laptops for students, or if they can bring laptop, it's fine. Yeah? Then they do doing homework in, in, in the breakfast hours and then enjoy all the trip and answer the question. Then they will concentrate when they walking, shopping. It's not just shopping. Then you, they, they won't forget. 
is a good memory for them while they're learning and exploring Japan. So um, I, I want all of our students, or even you are not our student, actually one counselor and one teacher join my course before, then they really enjoy it and enjoy the whole eight days. Right. Yeah. And then we have the video. <laughs> yes. Me? Yeah. A little bit, yeah. But I can read all Japanese, yeah. yeah. So there's no problem. I bring students uh, you know, walking down. And it, I actually, I facilitate two workshop how to make a ludo in Nissan. Uh, uh, you know, Nissan is uh, the biggest one, uh, 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 ludo manufacturer in Japan. And Kirin beer, how to make Kirin beer. <laughs> From flour to, uh, uh, the, in the back uh, in the package yeah okay so enjoy the video now Hi, my name is Drew Gephardt. I'm the International Services Manager. One of the things that I enjoy doing is working with faculty interested in creating study abroad programs. We have offered study abroad all over the world in many different subjects. One of the benefits of a faculty member is that you have this sort of wraparound support to develop our programs. Community members also can be a part of our trips by signing up for the courses and then attend the community orientations and the classes that we have. It opens up your eyes to new ideas, to new cultures. It opens opens up your worldview. Some students from my class have the first time apply the passport and the first time go abroad and see the other side of the world. I ran into one of the mothers of a student. She had just seen Drew in the international office in her household. It is mandatory for all of her children to do a study abroad program. She saw just how much her daughter was positively affected by study abroad. I want all of our students to experience that because it, it really helps you mature and grow as an individual. This impacts the trajectory of their educational career and important to us their sense of identity in terms of the world that your space is not limited to here. Your space is everywhere. It's a great way to stay connected with people from all over the world. The relationships you build, even with the people that you meet in the other country, are relationships that you can have forever. Also learn some experience in their life, and they won't forget that memory. When you have an experience where you're shown different ways by different people what is actually possible, it can be life-changing. Students that study abroad have higher retention, success, and completion rates, bar none. It excites learning. It's very unique for students at the community college level to get that experience abroad. They're really coming out well-rounded with the global experience. It's something that gives students an experience and an edge over students who learn just in the classroom. Intercultural competency is one of the things students are going to need to be able to go into the workforce. We talk about our students needing to get beyond that 40 mile radius. Faculty need to go beyond that 40 mile radius, beyond their masters and PhDs, and explore the world. You bring that richness back to your classroom. Taking students abroad benefits the institution as a whole. I really encourage faculty to engage and study abroad, and I'm thankful that that the Office of International Education supports in that process and we're seeing more and more faculty submit proposals and think about how exciting it would be for them and their students to go abroad. At the end of the day, it's not just the students that are going to learn, you are going to learn, you are going to grow. Contact the Office of International Education, explore ideas, talk to other faculty who have been or are doing study abroad and plan a trip. Find us online by going to www.peralta.edu underneath the student section click on study abroad to learn more about our upcoming programs, previous programs, as well as if you're interested in designing your own study abroad program, what we can do to help. If you're a faculty member thinking about undertaking a study abroad program, don't hesitate, don't sit on the fence, jump. We only have one time to live and make it count. On the uh, Peralta College's website, if you uh, navigate under the students section, we have a link for study abroad. You'll click on that, and then we have our six programs that have been approved. Um, so if you look, okay, we'll click on Business of Retailing in Japan. It works. So you click on the link, and then it has all of the details about the program. So it has the dates, when they're going, um, 
and all the information listed on here. So it looks like the first uh, deposit is due December 1st for this program, and then uh, we'll have other payments due in February and April. But uh, really what you want to do is start off by filling out, we have a pre-travel information form, and if you click on that and fill out this form, this is the application. Okay, so you want to fill this out, that way you get your, your, your name in there. All right? Uh, yes, sir. You need to take the class by eight days or? Yeah, so there is a class that's tied into it. You have to sign up for the class to go. And his class is Business 72, which is Principles of Retailing. So you're in Japan for one week, and then when you get back, you have two Saturday session classes on campus to complete the units. But it's basically a three unit class, and you take part of it in Japan, and then you finish it on campus. You need to sign up for the class. Actually, the, the class is available to sign up for now because it's officially a spring class. So if you go into the spring 2020 class schedule online and search his class code, which is on the form there, uh, you can actually sign up for the class now. It's, it's available. Okay. Uh, but the class is coming in 2020? Correct. It's a spring intercession class, so the class doesn't start until May. You'll, you'll start the class when you travel to Japan, and then you'll finish the class. I, actually, I think there's one meeting before you go for class and then uh, and then one when you get back. Okay. Yeah, and if you're graduating, one thing I encourage you to do is also talk to your counselors to see how this how a study abroad program may tie into your um, student education plan. And uh, if it's a class that you need as well, because this class is uh, CSU transferable so you want to see if that's a class that will help you to achieve your educational goals. So I would I would encourage you to talk to a counselor as well, okay? To see if it if it matters. President Karras, would you like to say a, a word? No? Okay, okay, he's good. All right, Andrea, would you like to come on up? So Andrea Lee is our uh, leader of our dance program. Yes, oh. I just want to know, December 1st is when you start taking deposits? Correct. We'll, we'll, we'll start taking deposits now. We put that we would like deposits in by December 1st for that program, but most likely what will happen is we will end up extending it until January. Yes. But we would like them in December 1st, is what we were asking for. Okay, Andrea? Yeah, great. Aquaba, which means welcome in tree. TWI, tree language in Ghana. So, um, my name is Andrea Lee, I'm the department chair of dance at Wayne College. Been taking students abroad since 2010. We had our official academic bearing program begin in 2012. Uh, the main thing that people ask me is, do I have to be a dancer to participate in the Dance Study Abroad program? The answer is no. We are a program that accepts all majors. Um, we're a community-based program, so we have students from Peralta, we also have students from other community college districts, and the community can also join the program. And that's probably true for most of the study abroad programs. But for sure, the Ghana program was de designed in that manner. So we have students, but we might have a student in their auntie, or we might have a student in their high school brother, or we just might have someone who comes from the community and they sign up for the course and they can go. So. You can be a full-time student, a part-time student, or a community member and join the program, but you do have to enroll in the course. And the course is Dance Study Abroad. And what is Dance Study Abroad? It is a historical and cultural tour through the lens of dance and other folk art forms, which basically means through the lens of traveling to Ghana, because if you go to Ghana, just by default, that is what it's about. It's the culture. Um, and there's just so many uh, parts of the, uh, uh, of the diaspora that connect. And when I say the diaspora, I'm talking about the African American diaspora specifically, because that's where a lot of African Americans are tracing their roots. They don't know because we understand history, but we do understand that that specific trade route, that specific African Atlantic slave train, uh, slave trade, is where we landed in lots of parts of the world. Okay, so you get that history. So we visit the Elmina and Cape Coast slave dungeons. We also visit a lot of villages, and we also visit uh, museums, and we do some ecotourism, like through the Kakum rainforest and things like that. So I'll show you a few photos. Um, but it's an enriching trip, and um, 
just like any other program, I think the one thing that students always come away with is that full intercultural communication, that full global education experience that just makes you a more well-rounded person. Um, one of the, and so that's what this study abroad is all about. Um, we'll just kind of go on here. So this is, um, so there's a, I think I saw the report um, that Drew uh, was, uh, uh, prepared, but there's a full study abroad report, and you heard some of it at the beginning of, the, uh, of Drew's presentation. But one of the things I did recently, I was at the Umoja conference and I presented to an audience of uh, a lot of African American students and educators um, that were interested. And what's great about Peralta is that our program is actually exceeding the mark of what's happening in the rest of the, the, the United States, quite honestly. Um, I, our program focuses on African countries. Um, 70, about 70% of all programs, U.S. undergraduate programs, travel to European countries. 3.9% of undergraduate programs offer countries to Africa as study abroad. So France is really like exceeding uh, the benchmark on that. Um, for any how many faculty are here? Like, faculty are by far making the difference. You ask most students, how do they hear about the program? What, made, what was the tipping point, it was that one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member or a staff, that engagement, that, so faculty really make a difference in, in terms of what's happening, and, and if you look at Drew's report, I think it was 40%, 40% of students said the reason why they said it abroad was because of the outreach of the faculty member. So that is really, really important. Um, and so I think that there's no doubt that it was the faculty approach to students that allowed us to have so many students in our program and more males. Because that's the other disparaging statistic is that there's less men that study abroad than women. So we've been doing a lot of work on that. And then we were able to see that flip because when I first started the program, it was all female. And then this last year, we could see the difference. We had more than half of our program were African American males. So that was great. Can we go um, this is a picture, like I said, we had 23 people on the trip. Um, these are the young men, they wanted to do the men's photo. So um, we also collaborated with um, Col uh, Diable Valley College. So we had students from College of Alameda, Laney College, um, not Berkeley City College, Merritt College, and then Diablo Valley College. And we actually had some faculty and, counsel and one counselor from Diablo Valley College. Um, there's a professor at the top with the white hat, Professor Elliott, he's a professor of music. Quasi Wilson is a professor here of intercultural communication on the top left. So um, that's the hanging out. Okay. Um, so I kind of already talked about why Africa is important. Um, again, there's only 3.9% of countries, of, of universities that offer any study abroad programs to Africa. So we want to, we want to, move the needle on that. Um, it's, um, it's also a destination, like I said, of, of, of great cultural connection here, so that history is important to learn. So again, why Africa? And I kind of already explained some of those things, but for the students who went, we did um, some self-reflection assignments, and these were the big things that come up. Come up. The self-awareness, the sense of belonging. Um, what you said, Christina, about just getting out there and seeing what other people are doing and on about the business aspect, one of the things they were really impressed about was the innovation that they saw, which was contrary to the stereotypes about poverty and about not having and about just not being current or with the times, and they were really impressed by the innovation that they saw. The transportation? The transportation? Yeah. Meaning you're interested in transportation or? No, Right, yes. And the other and the other things they were saying was like, I didn't realize Ghana or Africa had skyscrapers. There's just a lot of stereotypes about Africa. I mean, let's be real. So, you know, the fear. Um, I had one student at one time, her parent told told her, Don't eat the fruit or you'll die. 
because they've been told a lot of things about the water and the parasites and this and that. So there's a lot of, there's, there's other levels of fear that I have to just, when we, and we deal with that in the orientation, right? Um, and then it was just holistically edifying, you know, just to be in a place where they felt like they weren't being judged. And so that was, that was edifying for them. Okay. And so we kind of talked about some of the reasons why you want, why global education is important, right? You are more likely to be employed. It's a, intercultural education are those skills. We call them soft build skills, but they're, they're no way soft. Those are not soft skills. They're really not, you know, being able to identify and, 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 and relate to people um, from different backgrounds is, is, is a skill and it's needed. Um, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, as you've already mentioned, staying relevant in an ever-changing globalized world, the bill of critical thinking and social emotional intelligence skills. Okay? Um, those are some students from our 2017 trip. We just came off of the cocoon rainforest. Um, the student on the left, she joined us from UC Santa Cruz. She's graduating this semester. Uh, the student in the middle is my daughter. <laughs> and uh, she traveled. And the student on the right uh, is Charles. He uh, graduated from College of Alameda and he's at Clark, Atlanta. In fact, we were in Ghana, and he left Ghana on a plane to Clark. So we rerouted him, so that was great. And then Michaela, also on the right that you see, she is a student at College of Alameda. So, um, haven't seen her. And this photo is a picture of a place called, um, it's in a location in western region of Ghana called Asen Mansu, and that river is called the Last River, and it's called the Slave River. That is literally the place that Africans who have been walked uh, from other parts of Africa, far as 300 miles away, that river was the last place where they were bathed before being taken or marched to the slave dungeons. So there's an area that you see that's like a mass grave because basically what would happen at that moment was those who were weak were killed, put into a mass grave, and those who were strongest felt that they would survive the slave dungeon moment, which they could stay there, by the way, up to a year before they actually got put on the ship. So it wasn't like you just get to the dungeon and you get to the slave ship. You're there for a while till the cargo is <laughs> filled up, the human cargo. So um, this was a spiritual moment for a lot of the students. So you see them there in the water, waiting in the water, literally, and um, just giving honor to the ancestors who passed away on the, um, through the whole tragedy of the mid-Atlantic slave trade. So that was, um, I think that's the last slide. Okay, and if you have any questions about Ghana, we're going to Ghana and Tanzania this year. So it's two weeks in Ghana, two weeks in Tanzania, or you can do both. Um, Tanzania is East Africa, so we're just sort of doing a West East Africa. And then in East Africa, um, again, pretty much the same type of format. Um, and then also we're gonna add in a four day uh, safari in, um, in Tanzania. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to invite Simone and Christina up. You guys get to take center stage. <laughs> All right. Christina is a student uh, who went to Egypt this past summer, and that was our Arabic program. And then Simone uh, went to Japan uh, with uh, Simon Chan's business program. Unexpected question, or excuse me, unexpected experience. Um... A lot, uh, just how busy the streets were, how full uh, every area that we kind of came across was, where there was eating or the public transit or even having breakfast time in our hotel, which you're like, okay, this is, this is my space, this is my hotel, I'm going to go back there later. And, you know, but uh, there was just so many people everywhere, and that was awesome. Um, very, very, very different though. Very different uh, as far as the public transit, because the public transit's here, there's lots of people, and there's peak hours, but there's always people filling up those uh, alleyways and subways and all those things 24-7 there, so very, very unexpected. <laughs> uh, so, 
you know, I think everything was unexpected because y you don't know what to expect when you're going there. So, you know, you learn to work on the fly with everything. And so it's funny to piggyback off of what you said about the traffic. Um, and I know Christina knows, but the traffic in Egypt is outrageous and it is second to none. I mean, Los Angeles traffic is, is painful. This stuff was six or seven highways of just nonstop traffic and like and there's no rules there's no you know signals saying turn left turn right so so that was new for us you know for us you know we're like wait 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 he's crossing you can't turn but they're like yeah it's safe to go so those were unexpected things as far as um definitely traffic public transportation what 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 we know as strict rules um that doesn't, doesn't exist there but um you know, something else that was unexpected is, um, and I, I know I share this with Drew, but uh, one of the young ladies that went, well, I shouldn't say young lady, but Miss Gloria, um, she was one of the older ladies that went on the trip with us. And I, I think I partnered with her and she was, I learned so much from her. And I didn't expect to go there and meet a, I shouldn't tell her age, but a 60 plus year, 67, I wasn't gonna tell her real age. Um, yeah. To, to meet her, connect with her. Um, it was like having a, a, a second mother on the trip. And um, we took a, I wanna say it was almost eight mile hike to go zip lining down. And she was like the leader of the group, you know? And, and she inspired me to keep going and I inspired her. And you know, we, we built a, a bond and we, we, we talk uh, at least once every three weeks and just to make sure we're still motivating each other and so I think that was unexpected I didn't expect to you know meet a second mom on the trip yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm so glad you shared about glory okay um, what is one aspect of the culture that you would like or to be seen more in the US something that you experienced or saw about their culture that you think should be adapted here in the in the US something that I'd, I'd probably have to say the, the sense of unity and togetherness, um, it's, it's specifically in, in Belize. It, it's, it's, there's, there was definitely a, a bonding of the people. Um, they're going through a little bit of um, transition with their energy and, and, and receiving energy from Mexico and some of the disputes that they're having with Guatemala. And they're really political people. And they really take the people's voice to their politicians. And I think that's something that I wish we actually put back in place, that the people had a voice and representation. And it was not, you know, me, 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 me. It's more, well, what's good for the team? So I think that's something I wish we could bring to maybe just Peralta to start. Yeah. Um. One thing that I really appreciated and that I was so uh, blown away by as far as being uh, in Japan for the time that I was there was just the sensibility of um, people and their efficiency and their consciousness uh, for, uh, for themselves and for others. Um, one thing that was ma a major uh, Eye opener was just how their uh, trash systems were. So I don't, I don't know. This probably sounds strange, but <laughs> they were very conscious of the waste, and that was interesting to me. Just because, again, being here in the Bay Area for so many years, uh, yes, we have plenty of garbage systems, and you know, people choose to use them or not, you know. But it was really, really nice to see how um, conscious people were for their resources and tidiness and efficiency as far as just uh, managing themselves and being conscious of others in that respect, yeah. Um, something from Egypt that I noticed uh, just going down the streets and watching the news was um, it seems like America's just fed fear and they're just watching the news. It wasn't like that. It wasn't about who got robbed, who got shot, or, 
or whatever. It wasn't about who stole something. It was just um, like positive world news and it was good. It was actually relaxing and it made me look at the news, which I already knew here, but actually to see in another country, like, wow, we're really fed fear. And then I seen like little kids walking down the street, like your mom's not worried about you, you know, like I seen babies walking or, you know, like five-year-olds walking behind goats. And it's like a mother here be like, don't walk behind the animal, you're gonna get kicked. It was just, everybody's so worried and afraid here where there was just about survival living and it seemed like they were working together and happy wow. where everyone's just kind of everything's in fear here so oh that's awesome is there any questions that you guys have yeah uh, i'd like to know did you interact with the people in the community uh what kind of interactions were there uh, with the community? um one of the great ones was we went to the um the Nubian village. And so we got to actually uh, take a little boat ride into the village and um, shop and do henna and kind of walk around their village and see how they lived a little bit. Um, they worship the crocodile. So they had crocodiles above their doors for protection. And um, they actually had crocodile, like baby crocodiles. And then they had big crocodiles in these cages. And then we got to see them like sing their regular songs that they sing and um yeah it was pretty cool but we were always just on the go 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 so we didn't have a lot of time with the locals mm -hmm. but yeah about japan or oh i just see if they can answer you want to answer okay. that question? um yeah interacting with the community it was very welcoming uh at first i had apprehensions of like trying to talk or you know there might be some language barriers but i was able to just kind of like take out my phone you know and just say like hey like point to this or try to like use google translate and people were very welcome to show you or i actually took pictures with like maybe two groups of people they were young people but they were interested in my appearance. I was interested in their appearance. Um, and then like another group, it was like, again, we kind of like bonded with our, our clothing. <laughs> and for me, it was like, of course I bonded with people with the cool outfits or the interesting outfits, or that was what interests me. But not only that, but you know, it was, that was a similarity that brought us together. So that was really cool just to see um, the appreciation and the acknowledgement of both cultures seeing each other, yeah. So, um, y yes, we, we interacted um, specifically um, on the Jamaica trip. And I know a lot of people hear Jamaica and you think, ooh, like the beach. Um, but if anyone knows Dr. Suri Brown, there was no, ooh, the beach. We actually lived in the community there was like no hotel we lived with families in their maroon communities slept on the floor or you know with our little mat and, and we loved it it was like the greatest thing ever um you don't think you can adapt to the cold showers but you really appreciate those cold showers on day two like on day two you need the cold shower because it's so you know humid and you're literally walking everywhere. There was no bus transportation. There's no like fancy shuttle taking us from, you know, this tour to that tour. We actually had to walk to our destination. So yes, we interacted. We ate whatever they cooked us, which was whatever fish we could find that day uh, for our meals. And if we didn't have fish, then we just ate what was in the yard. And they literally pulled the vegetables out of the yard to to cook or make teas or or whatever it was. And so, yes, we interacted with the community big time um, in, in Jamaica, big time. Uh, well, specifically in our Arabic trip, um, we, it was a language-based course. So we went to the Ma'adi Institute 
and we actually took a uh, class on you know history and then also the language. We started out here at this you know at uh, Berkeley City College learning the language, um, and then we went there. So it would just help us interact with um, the community. So yes, we did learn language there. In Belize, it's an English-based uh, you know country, and so yes, we did learn a little bit in Jamaica as well. It's like it's like Creole, like a patois. So yeah, man, we learn, we learn. Yeah, yeah. Um, as far as the Japan trip, uh, yes, we did get some language integration uh, through the course of the days. In the morning, we uh, spent maybe an hour uh, going around learning the different uh, pronunciations of the alphabet. It was very challenging for me just because maybe two letters equal one letter and but it was helpful because when I was out in the the streets, you know, I could read things or things made a little bit more sense to me or just hearing other people speak while they're in their uh, you know, eating or while they're shopping and different things. It was like, "Oh, that's what they're saying." Or, oh, "Okay, that that's kind of making a little bit more sense to me." But it was very, very nice to have that time period with our uh, docent to to just ex explore the pronunciation and the t present tense past all those things well um it did help did it stick all the way i would need a lot more time but <laughs> it was very helpful to have it while we were there yes uh, just one little thing um so we went to Egypt to learn Arabic, and we had two weeks before we actually went. So we took we learned some basic Arabic. Um, and when we got there, it, there's a lot of hustlers, and they just don't leave you alone. And no matter what you tell them, they stay on you. And so um, one time we got off the boat, and we were going to a temple, and... Um, a little kid took to me. He must have been like nine. And, and, and so I was just, he's talking to me and all these people are talking to me. And, but he told me what to say to them. And so, he, and then he made sure I knew how to say it. And so once I learned how to say it, those people left me alone. And I said, oh, I know the golden word. And so, so later on, I, you know, people, some people would just get, it was just very overwhelming when they just would harass you and try to sell you stuff. And I would tell them, say this, say this. And they're just like, whatever, Christina. And I'm like, no, say it. And as soon as they said it, they would get left alone. And so it's so funny because now um, I hear anybody talking Arabic, you know, I could say hello and just kind of talk to them a little bit. But when I'm at the store, I'm able to say, and it's um, mafish flus, and it means I don't have no money. <laughs> mafish flus, mafish, mafish flus. Yeah, it's like a, I'm out of money. Yeah, and it, and yeah, so it was pretty cool. <laughs> we're, we're, we're closing out. So, just in one sentence, why do you think that all students should partake in a study abroad program? Or two sentences. One or two sentences. Um, it's very life it, to expand your horizons. To enrich yourself and uh, establish yourself as a global citizen. Where, where you, where you've gone, is a part of you. So to travel to other places will only add to who you are. <laughs>